So if you clicked on this video, it's probably because you look at a lot of old Fender Stratocasters and you saw this one and thought, something is vastly different about that guitar than the rest of the old Strats that I've seen. And that was exactly my feeling too, when these, the pictures of this guitar started coming through on my phone. My jaw just dropped because it was so special. I just, I just had to learn more about it. Um, it wasn't for sale when the pictures came through, uh, but I just knew I had to be in the same room with it. This is from 1957, early 1957, according to the potentiometer codes. Um, but what makes it special is that it is a factory custom color matador red, I believe, according to the color chart. And it's got a factory anodized aluminum pick guard in gold. But not only that, it's also got the factory anodized aluminum tremolo cover and it's a one and three quarter inch nut. Clearly this guitar was custom made for someone. And uh, when I flew out there to check it out, I, I thought it was custom made for one guy, but when I got it home and found a picture of it in the book, I realized that it was actually a little bit more special than that. So the story where how I found this guitar was really wild. I was actually chasing a totally different guitar and it was very, very rare, very special, almost as special as this one. It's from 1958, here's a picture of it. It's a 1958 Gibson Les Paul Custom. But it wasn't just any standard Les Paul Custom from 58, it was a two pickup version instead of the three pickups. A very rare variation, there's maybe 20 or 30 examples made between 1957 and 1961. I've been chasing this guitar for two years and there's gonna be a forthcoming video about that one that I'm excited to tell you about. Uh, but long story short, it was in uh, Bloomfield, New Mexico, which is about two and a half hours away from Albuquerque. So uh, I had been talking with those sellers for two years and we finally, you know, got ready to make a purchase and I had a flight booked. Um, I booked my flight on a Wednesday for the following Monday. On Thursday, I started getting a, a call about this guitar. And um, it was a guitar shop in Albuquerque and um, they said this guitar came in for appraisal and I think it's just a little more special. We might need some help with this one. You know, what do you think? And he tells me what it is. He says it's red with a gold pick guard. And I thought, wow, I mean, that's, that's possible. I know of one other example that looks that way. This is a picture of Pee Wee Creighton, who was a blues artist in the 1950s and uh, up through the 70s. And he's famous for playing this guitar. They call it the Pee Wee Creighton Stratocaster. And it is red with a gold anodized aluminum pick guard. I have not been able to inspect this guitar. It's in a museum, I believe in Memphis. So you can actually go see it. Um, so I don't know if it has the anodized aluminum uh, tremolo cover or the wide neck, but I suspect it has some very custom features as well. Um, I'm told that that guitar was made in 1954. I think it may have probably left in 55, but it could be a 54 as well. So a very special example that, um, that was the only one I had, I had heard of uh, that was even similar to this guitar. So that's the Pee Wee Crate Stratocaster. I knew this was not it because that guitar is in a museum. So I'm talking on the phone with the guitar shop owner and they said, yeah, it's not for sale. We, you know, they're really just trying to look to get a value for it so that uh, they can put it on insurance. You know, he, they don't want to sell. And I said, that's totally fine. I just want to be in the same room as this, as this guitar. So we were talking and, and they were asking, um, you know, where do you live? And I say, I operate from Birmingham, Alabama, but I travel a lot to buy vintage guitars. I was in Portugal, you know, uh, last August and London. It was in Norway last February. And I have a flight book to go to Albuquerque on Monday. And he said, Albuquerque, that's great. We're about 10 minutes from the airport. So at that point, I was just so excited. I was like, this is fantastic. I'm gonna fly in, buy that guitar, drive back into Albuquerque to inspect to just get in the same room as a guitar this special. I was so excited. Um, so that's what happened. Uh, Monday flew out and bought that two pickup Les Paul Custom. It did not have a pick guard, so we're getting a pick guard made for it right now, and that's when it's gonna be kind of officially uh, ready to film. Um, and then I drove back in and we sat there and inspected this guitar for about two hours because it was so special, it was really important to authenticate everything that we see here to make sure, you know, is it, is it what it appears to be? Is it factory original or is it just a lash up parts guitar that someone knew about the Pee Wee Creighton Stratocaster and wanted one to look similar? Um, so when I got to Albuquerque, uh, the, the shop owner told me the whole story and they said that their uncle was a professional banjo player in the Los Angeles in the 1950s. And those are the people that got special guitars from Leo Fender, you know, the, the professional musicians that lived in the Los Angeles area, you know, um, Fullerton, California was just right down the street. And, you know, if you knew someone or had an end of the factory or were a professional musician, 
you might get something special made. Um, so it kind of stuck out weird to me that the banjo player would have ordered or gotten custom made a wide neck guitar. Because this is one and three quarter inch, it's not one and five eighths like the standard Strad neck. And not only that, it's also really fat too. It's 93 hundredths of an inch where a typical 57 might be like 84, 85 hundredths of an inch. Um, so I thought that's strange because you know, this guy played tenor banjo, which had very skinny, small necks and four strings. Um, here's a picture of him. His name is Red uh, Roundtree, Luther Roundtree. If you look up kind of information about this guy, he played on so many different things. One band he was in was called the, um, the Sons of the Pioneers, you know, a kind of classic kind of um, uh, country western band in the 1950s up through the 70s, which had a ton of different musicians. He also played with Elvis, um, so uh, he was a big time player, um, you know, and supposedly had some like Spade Cooley connections and, um, you know, so he was kind of in the circles of people that might get special guitars. So that kind of made sense to me at the time, and if you're following on Instagram, you probably saw that reel where I had just gotten this guitar and told that story about Red Roundtree. And since his uh, nickname was Red, we thought, well, maybe that's why he got a red guitar. <laughs> so um, I was wrong about that. Uh, because when I got the guitar home, I, it just wasn't making sense to me. I was like, why would the banjo player get a very special Strat that had you know, a, a wide neck? And yeah, it, just, it just stuck out to me as weird. So I started going through all my Fender books um, until I got to this one. And this is by Tom Wheeler. It's called the Fender Archives. Uh, Tom Wheeler is no longer with us, uh, but this is a fantastic work of Fender history and has amazing stuff. One of the only places that you can find production totals, and very few, admittedly, um, but like the production totals for Fender guitars in 1966 is in this book. Um, so I love this book, and you can see on the front we've even got a uh, P base in custom color red with what looks like maybe a gold guard and gold hardware. Anyway, so I was just, I was looking through every single book to see if I could find, I just thought there's, there's gotta be something more out there about this guitar. It's just too special, too interesting. So then I got to page 36 and here's a picture of what I saw. This is um, kind of a famous guitarist named Roy Lanham. And uh, I was just looking through this book and I was looking at all the old pictures from the 50s and I got to this picture, which I've seen a bunch of times before reading this book. And then I read the caption and it says, Speedy West tears it up on pedal steel at Anaheim's Harmony Park Ballroom in 1957. So I'm like, oh wow, same year. Uh, and then it says, looking on the great takeoff guitarist, Roy Lanham probably didn't mind the mineral streak on his Stratocaster's neck. And as soon as I read that, it just clicked. I was like, wait, mineral streak, I know that. And I looked at the picture and I looked at the dark streak that's clearly visible in this image. And when you compare it to the mineral streak on this guitar, it's exact. Uh, it terminates right here on the bass side of the 15th fret marker, goes all the way to the end of the fretboard on the treble side of the last marker. And you can see that the contrast is kind of boosted in, this, in the image in the book to kind of make it pop a little bit better. So it may appear darker in the book, but uh, in the book you see a, you know, it's a black and white photo, so we don't know exactly what color, but we see a solid color Stratocaster with clearly an anodized aluminum pick guard and just a clear mineral streak. And I, I thought about it for like 30 minutes and I was like, there's no way this is the same guitar. It just can't be, it's too, too much of a coincidence. I texted my friend Francesco, uh, Chesco's Corner Guitars in Italy, who's just a really brilliant Fender, uh, you know, researcher and, um, you know, collector and a dealer and a good friend of mine who's always been willing to help, um, you know, when I'm not sure about stuff. And he said, that's the same guitar. And I thought, okay, you know, we're both really excited to maybe have found, you know, the same guitar. So I texted my friend Terry, um, who's the author of this book here. So if you like old Fender stuff, I recommend you buy one. It's Fender, The Golden Age. I texted that picture to Terry and I said, hey, am I crazy or is this the same guitar? And Terry texted back, that's the same guitar, you found it. And then he texted me this picture. So this is another picture of Roy Lanham. This is the back of his album cover from 1963, actually. By that time, he was probably playing a Jaguar because Roy Lanham was the original promoters of the Fender Jazzmaster. So when you see 
um, you know, pictures of Roy in that famous album cover. He's playing a red jazz master with non-matching headstock. That means that guitar, you know, it's got a tortoise shell pick guard, so it may not be a 58, it might be a 59 or 60. Um, but, um, you know, this, this picture on the back of his album cover is clearly the same guitar. If you zoom in on that mineral streak, it just matches exactly. Uh, so we have two pictures of this guitar with Roy Lanham playing it. And you see in the first picture, there's, there's not much wear on the fretboard. And in the second picture on the back of the album cover, you can see that the wear on the fretboard matches exactly um, the, the wear on the guitar. So um, while we may have bought it from the nephew of the banjo player, and clearly he owned that guitar for you know a good time and you know played it and he even installed a mute on the headstock that's what these two holes are that's from a mute to mute the strings like a tenor, tenor banjo player might want to do um, I don't think the banjo player played it very much I think uh, since he was playing in the same band as Roy Lanham which was the Sons of Pioneers they're both credited as having played in that band along with half the musicians in Los Angeles in that time period you know it's possible they overlapped there we really don't know. Um, but at that point, I was, I was convinced that the original owner of this guitar was not the banjo player, but it was in fact Roy Lanham. Uh, so that makes it a pretty historically significant guitar. And uh, we can just match up this mineral streak perfectly to these two photos of Roy with it. I'm still looking for more photos of this guitar and Roy during that time period, probably 19... 57 to maybe 59 probably is when he got that jazz master we're just kind of guessing um, but if you um, it, it, you know if you are uh, have any access to old pictures of Roy and look through and you see this strat please let me know uh, you can contact me at the uh, description below I would love to collect as many photos of it as possible of Roy playing it and possibly even the banjo player too um, you know it's possible that he uh, may have may have been photographed playing it so we're looking for as many as we can to find it. Um, but yeah, at that point, I was convinced. This was, in fact, Roy Lanham's uh, Stratocaster and not the banjo player. Um, and at that point, I was, just, I, I was just blown away. I couldn't believe that everything lined up, and uh, it was incredible. Um, so yeah, so you can tell that I actually own this guitar now. <laughs> the, the, um, the people that inherited it um, didn't really want to sell, but I, I sort of twisted their arm, as it were. Um, I made sure to um, come home with the guitar. So I'm, I'm so thrilled to have it uh, for the time that I do get to have it. Thank you very much um, to that family uh, for selling me this guitar. Um, I'm so thrilled to get to kind of catalog it, bring it back into circulation, and get to hear it actually played again. Uh, so. So yeah, let's talk about how we were able to verify, before we knew that this was Ray, uh, Roy Lanham's guitar, and we can kind of see it's in the same configuration there, because uh, I didn't know that until I got home. As I was there at the, the guitar shop in Albuquerque, we needed a way to inspect and verify that this is a factory original uh, red with gold guard guitar. Um, so here's how I did that. So the first thing that I saw as soon as the pictures came in from Albuquerque is that I could tell that the shape and direction of the finish checking matched exactly what I would expect a custom color Strat to look like from the 1950s. And it's nearly impossible to get your hands on one, but I actually did have one. I had a factory black 1958 Stratocaster um, a year or two ago that my friend Francesco actually owns now. And, and that's what drew us to that guitar was the, the shape and direction of the finish checking. A lot of people call this vertical checking, but it, that depends on, <laughs> it actually depends on which way you're holding the, the guitar. So I like to call it parallel uh, checking. So it's parallel to the strings. It kind of goes this way. Um, that's, that's the way it should go. Uh, and not only that, but in the kind of uh, wear on the edge of the body, we see a desert sand color uh, undercoat, which is what we would see on a custom color finish from like 56, 57 up to about 63 I believe that's when it changed to kind of the bright white undercoat so at that point even without taking the guitar apart we've got enough information to book a flight and book a flight now because you know opportunities to take a look at these are just so few um, so we've got the desert sand undercoat we've got the parallel finish checking and then um, the guitar shop owner had actually taken the strings off and pulled the pickguard open so that we could see the cavities. And when you're verifying a custom color Fender guitar, this is one of the most imp important pictures you need to get because 
Um, up until about 1964, depending on the model, there's a couple of tells that we can look for to make sure the finish is original. One of those is the nail holes compared to the screw holes. So if we zoom in here, on the outer edge of the pick guard area, you can see some large holes and some small holes. Um, there's about four small holes. The small holes are called nail holes. They were like little brads that were uh, hammered into the body and they were used to support the body while the finish cured before they had a paint stick. And we know this for sure because you can actually go back to Fender, Fender factory footage from 1957 and you can see a custom color strat sitting on a Lazy Susan with nail holes sticking out. Um, and so uh, consequently, or actually uh, coincidentally, uh, in that same video, which I'll link to below, you can see a video of Roy Lanham at the Fender factory playing the Jazzmaster prototype in 1957. I have scoured that footage to see if this guitar is in the background. It is not. So anyway, you should go watch that anyway because it's got a lot of cool history. So anyway, so on the base side of the, the neck pocket, we see one nail hole. And then on the treble kind of horn, we see another nail hole. And what we're looking for there, we're looking for clear and sharp edges of those nail holes because after that finish cured, they would rip the nail out. And so if you kind of finished over it, you would see paint inside that nail hole, which would be problematic uh, for this guitar. Not for every single one. We're gonna look at a blue Jaguar from 1966, which actually does have paint in the nail holes. And I can show you a couple other examples that also have paint in the nail holes from Jaguars in 1966, but pretty much not for any other model. So anyway, we've got a one on the base side of the neck pocket, one on the treble side horn. We've got one on the base side of the bridge plate, kind of just above the screw hole. And then one, I don't have it photographed here, but it's underneath the, um, the output jack plate. So we've got clear nail holes. We have sharp cavity edges. They're not kind of milky and thick. They're sharp. You can see that the thickness of the finish is pretty thin. It's a very kind of thin and delicate finish. And then if you look at the worm route, that's the route in the bridge pickup cavity that was meant to enlarge that area so that your um, the leads from the pickups can kind of sit flat inside there and not bottom out on the bottom of the um, uh, of the route. So what we want to see on a on a worm route like that, we want to see kind of those grist hairs where the uh, where the router kind of left sharp edges of that route. We want to see those kind of thin and and not thick and milky with other coats of paint on them. So that's what we see, uh, textbook, ex exactly what we wanna see here. Um, so uh, then we go to the back of the pick guard um, and we see all factory solder joints. We see undisturbed tape. We see a um, potentiometer code, 304704. So that is the fourth week of 1957. Um, so that's basically how we're dating this guitar is based on that one potentiometer code because we don't have a date on the end of the neck heel, which is very interesting for this one. I was talking to Terry about it and he said, for something this custom, they didn't need it because this was not in the standard kind of factory production line. Um, but on the back of the neck heel, you can see some pencil marks here. Um, this says wide neck in pencil and then W-N in red pencil. So I'm assuming that's wide neck. It was probably done at different parts of the manufacturing process to make sure you know, someone didn't think that it was, you know, a factory error or something. Later in 1962, they actually started having letters to indicate the neck width. So A is an inch and a half, B is inch and five eighths, C is inch and three quarters, and D is one and seven eighths inch. So uh, that's, that's pretty rare to have a D neck Stratocaster. So this one would have been a C neck had it been made after 1962. Um, and then, um, so as we take the neck off, you can see on the back of the neck plate, what I call like the puzzle pieces. It's like the marks where the finish adhered to the metal and kind of pulled off in a certain pattern, which will show you two things, really. It will show you the layers of the finish, so we can see that desert sand undercoat. And then you can also see a very specific puzzle piece marks, and you can line them up exactly. Um, this is not 100%, you know, I have seen tricky puzzle piece marks before on guitars that were not exactly original, but it is just kind of one more layer to the authentication of this guitar. 
um, before we got actual photo evidence from 1957. So then I got to a really interesting part um, that was kind of underneath the anodized aluminum tremolo uh, cavity plate, which by the way is one of maybe two examples known so far. I'm not sure if the Pee Wee Creighton guitar has the anodized aluminum trim cover, um, but it might. Uh, you can only see the front of it in the museum. So. Anyway, uh, just above the trim block, I saw another set of nail holes that I had not really seen before. And I'm still looking for another example of this, but it has an interesting set of nail holes in the back of the body there. I'm not sure why. Um, it just does. <laughs> so uh, another thing that was pretty cool on the back is that it has a ground wire going from the tremolo claw to, um, to ground out on the back of the uh, trim, trim cover. It must have been just an extra layer of shielding to make sure it didn't hum. I think that's super cool. They grounded, you know, everything to try to get this one because this was the very, you know, most professional strat he could make at the time. Um, you know, this was the this was the creme de la creme, 1957. So that was really interesting. And I looked at the solder here, and I'm convinced it's original, um, even though I've not yet seen that before. I think they added that because it was a very special custom guitar. Um, so those were kind of all the things that I was looking for as I was there on the ground making a big boy offer to buy this guitar just to make sure, all right, are we 100% sure this is what we think it is? And then when I got home and got those two pictures of photo evidence which supported the same conclusion that I had already come to, uh, was kind of like, all right, yeah, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> pretty sure that this is what we think and hope it should be. So when it came to identifying the color, I had to go back and do a little bit of research because as I was looking at it, I thought, oh, that looks a lot like Fiesta Red, but it's a little more red and a little more orange and a little less pink and pastel than Fiesta Red, as far as I can remember. Um, so I actually reached out to my friend Terry, uh, the author of uh, Fender the Golden Age, and thought, okay, this is a pre-custom color chart, so what is the best way to identify the color? Uh, the, the Fender Custom Color Chart came out in the summer of 1961, and those are Duco colors that have Fender names on them, usually derived from a Duco color, which is DuPont. Um, so Terry said, if you want to identify a 50s custom color, go back to the Duco color charts and uh, from that time period and see if you can find a match. Usually there's like uh, the Duco color charts for different um, American-made cars like Chevrolet and Ford and that sort of thing. So I, was, I started looking up the, the color charts for 1956 because this one had a very early 57 date. So if we we're thinking about what color chart they might have, we might think they have a 1956 color chart. Um, and I came to this color, Matador Red, which looked kind of very similar to this one, kind of bright red and orangey, but not pink and pastel, like Fiesta Red, which also did exist during that time period. Um, so I kind of thought, you know, that looks that looks the most like it to me. Here's a picture of the, the color chart to show you what I was thinking of. It's cool that it's right next to like Sherwood Green. Um, but yeah, so that's why I went with Matador Reds because it just wasn't pink and pastel enough for me to think it was really Fiesta Red. Now, if you want to call this Fiesta Red, you could be right. Uh, because obviously this is paint from 1957 and it could have gotten, you know, darker or lighter or changed colors but it doesn't really appear to have a clear coat on top of it, so I don't think it changed colors that much. Um, so I also reached out to my friend uh, Joe Reggio, who's a fantastic uh, uh, guitar refinisher in Tacoma, Washington, and he bought this hoard of 1950s Duco paints, uh, so he actually has the original 50s paints that he can use to finish guitars with. And he kind of went on a similar journey as I did. He went back to all the color charts and kind of tried to match things up, and. And he kind of came to the same conclusion. We think that, yeah, this, this might be Matador Red. It might also be Fiesta, but Matador is kind of what we thought was the closest match. So what do you think? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Put them down in the comments there. Um, so now it is time for us to hear my friend Riggs play this really special Fender Stratocaster and this really fat neck. Um, so I'm excited for you to hear it and see how it sounds.
that's the 1957 Fender Stratocaster Factory Matador Red, we think, um, with factory original anodized aluminum pick guard and tremolo cover and the wide neck. Just a really uh, special guitar in its own right and historically important being one of Roy Lanham's uh, original um, Stratocasters before he went to the Jazzmaster and then the Jaguar. Um, so just, just I, I'm so thrilled to be at least a, a you know, part-time owner of this guitar, to be a caretaker of it, to be able to catalog it and photograph it inside and out and be able to kind of share it with the world. Um, now there are at least two red with gold pickguard. I have seen a picture of one other, uh, but I haven't been able to verify that one yet. Hit subscribe if you want to see more videos on vintage guitars. If you want to kind of follow the guitar safaris and uh, get the jump on the cool stuff coming in, stuff like this, uh, you can follow on at TrueVintageGuitar on Instagram. And um, yeah, thanks so much for watching.